Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. And it's my great pleasure to welcome today, today's program, Bob Yesterfeld, who is Vice President, North American Truckload Services at C.H. Robinson. And today we're going to talk about keep your truckload freight moving. Uh, we, we all know that the truckload industry is kind of a live, living, breathing animal, and it continues to evolve, you know, over time. And, and kind of the market today is, is different than it was, you know, last year at this time, and, and certainly it's going to be different you know, a year from now, and uh, you know, we're coming to the end of the uh, the summer period here, heading into the uh, the holiday season, which is uh, you know a very busy time for freight as well. And uh, so, what 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 better person to to bring on board than Bob to kind of get a pulse on what's happening in the market, get his perspective in working with shippers and, and carriers in terms of some of the things that uh, are happening out in the industry to, to help shippers, you know, keep their freight moving, basically, uh, you know, with with regard to everything else that's happening in, in the environment. Um, just a reminder for those of you that are, are joining us live uh, today that, you know, part of our goal here at Talking Logistics is to make this conversational. So uh, as Bob and I are having our conversation, if you have a question uh, for Bob, you can do so via the uh, submit a question button or via the chat feature. And, and I'll keep an eye on that. And uh, certainly if it's a, a good and appropriate question and, and we've got time, I'll, I'll try to weave that into the uh, into the conversation. Uh, just a reminder that if you are joining us as a visitor, you do have to sign in first before you can ask a question. So with that, Bob, welcome to the program. Adrian, thanks so much. Really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk to your viewership and uh, talk about truckload freight today. Great, and uh, uh, certainly uh, appreciate you making the time. Um, you know, like I always do when I, when I bring on a new guest, uh, I'm always interested in how folks got into the industry. So, you know, before we kind of talk about the truckload industry and what's happening, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, um, a little bit about your career path, how and why you got involved with uh, you know supply chain and logistics and, and what your current role and responsibilities are there at uh, CH Robinson. Sure, so I guess like many of us, I kind of fell into supply chain and logistics. You know, I studied marketing in college and the one thing I knew coming out of college was that I, I really wanted to be involved in a business to business environment. I wanted to focus on a service industry, but at that time, you know, supply chain and logistics maybe wasn't my, my primary, primary focus. I was really fortunate to find C.H. Robinson 15 years ago. And, you know, I think my career path has followed kind of a traditional career path within Robinson, you know, really starting in, in managing carrier and customer relationships, working in different sales and account management environments. I spent about nine years out in the field managing different branches across our organization and came back to Minneapolis about three years ago. Uh, I had previously worked for our Robinson Fresh division, which is our division that uh, markets fresh produce, and came back as the vice president of our produce sourcing and temperature controlled logistics. Recently, uh, beginning of this year, transitioned to my current role, which is, as you said, vice president of North American Truckload. In my current role, really my accountability is, is to lead our teams that are accountable for our truckload pricing strategies, um, our internal operations, and how we execute truckload on a daily basis as well as our, our capacity to go to market and how we interact with, with the carriers that we that we deal with and, and provide freight to every single day. So broad responsibilities and, and really excited about our place in the marketplace today. Great, great. I mean, I think, uh, you know, similar to a lot of our guests, you know, who kind of discover, you know, the logistics industry by, by accident, if you will. It wasn't, you know, their, their um, you know, what they studied, particularly in, in, in college. I think we're seeing more and more of that today where people are actually majoring in supply chain logistics and, and entering the field that way. But I think, uh, um, you know, a lot of the folks I talked to today kind of, uh, you know, kind of discover uh, the industry a after the fact. And, and it sounds like, you know, within your time there at uh, C.H. Robinson, you've, you've had a great opportunity to uh, be in a variety of different roles, which, which I think is an important, you know, aspect for any supply chain professional is really to, Kind of have that broad experience and really uh, look at the market from from different angles. So let, let's talk now about the uh, your, your current focus there with uh, with truckload. I mean, there, there's so many different factors you know impacting truckload transportation today, including regula regulations and, and the state of the economy. You know, where are we you know today compared to a year ago, and, and have the needs of, sh of shippers changed over the past year? Yeah, so great question, and obviously the question on the mind of a lot of people right now. I think it's clear for all of us on the call that the market has changed, right? And what is what have the drivers of that change been? It's it's a number of different things. You know, it, it seems that we've had a little bit of a healthy economy rec 
recovery, at least a brief recovery from an econometric standpoint. You know, the, no question that regulatory drag and some of the, the new regulations that have come into effect have impacted, you know, the overall marketplace here. Um, but in terms of the needs of shippers and how that's changed, I don't know that that, that that has changed a lot over the course year over year. You know, I think smart shippers and, and strong shippers have strategies that, that persevere through different market conditions. And, and really the needs of shippers are, you know, really focused on finding providers that, that are going to honor their commitments, finding providers that are going to bring creative, you know, innovative solutions that are grounded in, in analytics and, and strong technology. Um, ultimately, shippers are looking for providers to, to deliver the right service at the right price and either get product off their dock in an expedient manner or get it into their distribution center in an expedient manner, right? So I think what, what has probably changed a little bit year over year is, is the need of carriers. And that need of, of carriers um, is driving some of the prioritization or the decision making of shippers, I believe. And so as regulation has changed the, the field of play for, for carriers and, and service providers, that's causing shippers to maybe prioritize, prioritize a little bit different what their, what their most important needs are. You know, in, in the past, let's say, five years, shippers have really been able to focus on extracting costs from the, from the carrier transaction. Within the routing guide, if, if you weren't first, you, you probably weren't getting a whole lot of freight, and there wasn't a lot of routing guide disruption. In, in, in today's world, I think, again, shippers are feeling that capacity is somewhat finite and it hasn't felt that way for a while. So they're having to adjust strategies in order to deal with that. Um, you know, I think the, the whole concept of shipper of choice is starting to reemerge. It's somewhat cyclical as people talk about shipper of choice, but that's really reemerging today. Um, and, it, and it feels like shippers are really driving, at least the shippers that want to be successful, are really driving towards stronger collaboration with their providers because it feels like the environment that we're in may be more long term than it is short term based on some of the research that we see. Uh, you know, I, I, I love the fact that, um, you know, the, 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 the different perspective that you brought, mainly that, you know, maybe, you know, obviously what shippers the needs of shippers and 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 their desired outcomes are, are always the same, right? The, the really what changes is the environment around them in terms of trying to achieve those those, those outcomes. And and if anything, it's kind of looking at it from the carrier side. And really, that's where I think the the carriers, um, you, you know, the the operating environment and and their reality is is really probably what's changed the most over the past you know year or two. And, and then I, I, obviously, as you you mentioned, that that ultimately has. Uh, impact on how shippers, uh, you know, approach the market, and, and you talked about shippers of, you know, becoming a, a shipper of choice. I'll, I want to, I want to touch upon that a, a little bit later, but I, I, I want to first talk about a little bit about the regulations, you know, I, um, you know, such as CSA and hours of service. As you know, I, I talked about that as, as one of the factors that that's impacting truckload, you know, transportation. It's obviously something that's top of mind for for a lot of the the, the carriers. And I had your colleague uh, Jason Craig on, on the program a, a few weeks back. You know, giving us an update of some of these programs and what's happening in, in Washington. Um, but, but I'd love to get your perspective. I mean, what impact are, are these regulations having on on rates and service? And you know, which one concerns you the most? It's a, not, again, a great question. And I, I think it's really difficult. Customers ask us frequently to try to quantify the impact of CSA or hours of service or electronic logging devices, EOBRs. It's really difficult to quantify any one of them individually in terms of the impact to rate or cost. But what we do clearly feel is kind of this, just this, you know, snowball rolling downhill to use, I guess, a Minnesota analogy. Um, but, but the snowball of, of regulatory drag that's impacting the market overall. So, you know, when we look at, at them individually, hours of service, you know, we're all reading the same things, you know, three to five percent kind of reduction in productivity seems to be the norm of what people are reporting. Um, saw an interesting study done by ATRI that talked about some of the impacts of, of hours of service, and they called out that you know, 80 percent of the carriers that responded uh, responded that they had lost productivity in their fleet. 70 percent of the drivers that responded claimed to have uh, be making less money today under the new hours of service. And 50% of the carriers that had responded were essentially doing the same amount of work they were pre-implementation uh, of the new rules, but with more drivers. So, 
you know, clearly an impact to, to productivity related to hours of service. I think one of the, you know, one of the additional, I guess, accelerators of hours of service is some of the lack of, of infrastructure around truck parking. As I'm out talking to carriers, I hear a lot about the inability to find parking, not having the infrastructure to find parking, you know, taking upwards or north of an hour in some cases in some metro areas to find parking. And so when we think about, you know, the, the, the available time for a driver to drive, taking an hour to find a parking spot is pretty difficult, right? Pretty difficult to productivity. Um, CSA, obviously the, one of the other ones that's up there in the, in the spotlights all the time. And, and I think the thing with CSA today that, that we continue to hear is just a lack of understanding of the program overall, right? Should we be looking at basics? Should we be looking at the FMCSA, you know, traditional safety ratings? A lot of mixed messages in, in the shipper community in terms of how shippers are using those scores to make hiring decisions, which to me really lands on the fact that we need a national hiring standard for motor carriers because today there's so much risk uh, introduced to all of us to allow you know, state uh, judicial systems to, to assess or interpret CSA and, and make determinations. Um, again, you know, ATRI has done some, some research here and I, I think the thing that stood out is that I read is when they, they interviewed drivers about the key components of, of CSA and the average driver only got six of 14 you know, answers correct. That's, that's concerning and, and speaks to maybe some of the confusing messages around the program. Um, ELDs always in the headlines. You know, I don't know that any of us know where that, where that's going to land. I mean, it looks to be that 2017, 2018 is the horizon of, of some, you know, implementation if, if things go the way that we're seeing in the press. What we know is the large carriers have implemented, you know, many of the medium sized carriers have adopted. And there's varying reports of how, how engaged the smaller carriers have been with the, with the ELDs. Um, you know, I, I think what we read and what we've experienced is, is there's probably a catch up impact there for some carriers that just the adoption of, of ELD will potentially reduce um, capacity or productivity. And then the other one that, that we talk a lot about is CARB. And depending on, on the shipper's network and depending on how the shippers, where they, they operate, California Resource Board or CARB could be one of the largest impacts or it could be a non-impact. But so much of CARB is predicated on the age of equipment. And we're at a time today where equipment's at an all-time, you know, oldest fleet age. And we've got more constraints coming in around, you know, reducing the amount of capacity that can enter California based on that fleet age. So we're hearing anecdotally from carriers and from drivers that they're avoiding California altogether, which could be very challenging for so much of the product that's you know, either imported, manufactured, or grown in the state of California. The one thing that seems clear is there's more on the horizon, right? Yeah, no, those are all, you know, those are all, you know, just with your discussion there, I mean, it's clear all the different factors that, that are impacting, you know, the industry. The other thing, uh, which certainly I, I've uh, written about, and, and there's a lot of discussion around, is just, you know, driver, uh, driver, driver shortage, right, and driver retention, and kind of the different things that the industry needs to do in terms of being able to attract more people to the industry, uh, to be able to, you know, retain them, you know, so on and so forth. So that that always generates a lot of discussion as well, and, and the impact that, uh, that that that's having. So you know, obviously, you know, a lot of different you know things going on there, and and I think that leads to kind of the uh, a little bit of that volatility, I think, that a lot of people think about when they think about the, the truckload industry and what's happening there. I mean, when you see everything that you we, we've just talked about and everything that's probably that, that might be down the road and, and, you know, this volatility, I mean, is it changing the, the type of discussions that, that shippers are having with 3PLs and, and, and their carriers? Yeah, I, I think that it is. I think that we're definitely having different conversations today. And, and I go back to your comment on drivers. You really hit that on the head. I mean, I, I talk to a number of carriers on a regular basis, and they talk about the fact that, you know, they're well-capitalized carriers. They can go buy more trucks, but but that's not the issue. It's getting qualified drivers that can that can sit in those seats and, and be effective that they can attract and retain so, you know, that's an additional constraint that is driving some of this, this market volatility. You know, the, the thing that I would say about the conversations we're having with shippers is that they're different today. 
again, I made the comment earlier that, that capacity is, is finite and it hasn't felt that way before. So I think shippers, we're having a lot of conversations with shippers about what is their asset and 3PL strategy, right? We hear from shippers, they want to experience assets differently than 3PLs and smart shippers are finding the right balance about what that interplay looks like. Um, I, I think if, if I'm in the seat of a shipper, I want to I want to manage exactly no more than the number of providers that I need to execute my business on a daily basis, right? But we also know that the industry is is broad with 360,000 carriers, of which half those carriers only have one piece of equipment. So carrier uh, shippers are trying to figure out how to best access carriers of multiple sizes, geographies, regionals, locals, nationals. So I think that's been a different conversation that we're having in this marketplace than we've had over the course of the last few years. Um, a lot of conversations about procurement and best practices in procurement, you know, how can how can shippers establish regular rigor so that they don't get into situations perhaps where some found themselves in, in quarter one or quarter two of this year where routing guides started to fail significantly because of maybe having paper rates in, in some cases versus having you know sustainable routing guide routing guide rates. Um, compliance has, has obviously changed within the routing guide this year, and I think that's introduced some relationship volatility. And so we talked about market volatility and what are those impacts. Um, relationship volatility is something that I think we've experienced this year. And if we think about the stable market that we've been in for the last number of years. I know a number of people within customers that I deal with or carriers that I deal with or internally within, within our organization. Many of our people haven't experienced a dynamic change in marketplace like this. So it's the role of leadership, right, to help, you know, coach, teach, and train and, and bring companies together through those times of, of, you know, rapid market volatility. Yeah, all, all, all great points. And I think, I think those conversations are, are, are changing, uh, as you noted. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, becoming a shipper of choice. And, and I think the last time that um, – that that term was in vogue was back in the kind of the, the 2004 kind of time frame where capacity was you know very tight and, and I think it's probably the other kind of time period where those conversations were you know changing as well and, and shippers are really looking at their um, you know at their strategies at their relationships you know with the three PLs with their carriers you know and, and really I think you know back then as well as today I think it it it, it kind of the conversation a little bit more kind of a risk management. Uh, kind of perspective to the uh, to the to the challenge, right? How how are we going to get capacity, you know, in light of you know everything that's happening, you, you know, around us? And I think part of that strategy that a lot of shippers have is, is thinking about and kind of revisiting what it means to be you know become a, a shipper of choice. So uh, I guess I'll ask you the question, you know, how how does a shipper become a, a, a shipper of choice? And you know, what are some of the actions that you're seeing uh, you know shippers taking today? Yeah, I think it, to your point, it's, it's in vogue again. I, I think again, smart shippers have always had have focus on this, but it's it's certainly what we're experiencing today is carriers are trading up, right? I mean, given all the constraints, carriers are now in a position where they're trading up. And what I mean by that is, you know, not only are they looking at at customers at a holistic level, but because of an increased focus on yield management and the importance of driver retention, they're really for, focused on isolating issues within the supply chain that can impact either yield or, or driver retention and then eliminate. So whether that's trading up with a customer, you know, avoiding a certain warehouse, avoiding a particular lane, we're seeing a lot of activity there. And so I think shippers are feeling that and realizing that they have to you know, really focus on the driver experience, focus on predictability, right? That's what we continue to hear again and again from our carriers is predictability really matters to them. And when we start to see variance from that predictability, that's where it causes causes challenges and causes friction for them. Um, you know, I think areas that, that we've we've heard called out and worked with shippers on in, in terms of shipper choice initiatives. You know, I mentioned procurement earlier. That's one that really continues to to be at the forefront of shipper choice initiatives. Having a, a consistent procurement cycle is really important to to providers because. It allows the opportunity for both shippers and, and providers to readjust their networks, right? When we get outside of, of not having consistent procurement schedules, we run the risk of routing guide leakage and failures and, and start to see, you know, substitution in there. 
at higher cost. So that, that's an area of focus for shipper of choice. You know, another one that, that I think if you talk to any carrier that would rise to the top is around detention. And detention is an area, again, I'll, I, I referenced some studies earlier, but there was an FMCSA study done that, that showed detention impacted something like 80% of carriers' ability to execute against, against hours of service requirements. And detention is an area that we've heard the FMCSA start talking about getting involved in potentially regulating again or as well. But when you talk to a carrier, it's not about the regulation as much. They just want to avoid it. They just don't want detention because it, you know, drivers get paid to drive and not get paid to wait. So shippers are really focusing on, on that detention piece and how can they get drivers out expediently so that they have the same experience you know, day in and day out when they arrive at that facility. You know, drop trailers are an area when that can be great for, for shipper of choice. You know, drop trailers work really well for shippers. They were great for large to medium-sized carriers, um, but sometimes too much of a good thing can be a risk, right? And so I made that comment earlier about, you know, 50% of the carriers having one truck. I think something like 5% of the carriers have more than 30 trucks. So, you know, when we think about the type of carrier that a drop trailer pool really works well for, you know, expanding outside of just being a drop trailer shipper can help, you know, open access to capacity and help to present yourself as a shipper of choice for, for multiple size carriers. Um, what we hear around drop trailer pools is that appointments are not desired, right? So having to have an appointment in order to go in and drop a trailer can, can be a, a little bit of a, a black mark or a check mark against a particular shipper. And, and finally, it's, it's around payment terms. You know, as, as we've seen things kind of stabilize over the past few years, and, and obviously we've talked about the market today, but we do see more and more shippers trying to extend payment terms. We know that carriers operate on an extremely, you know, extremely narrow margin, and anything, you know, outside of the norm in payment terms can be a real detractor um, for the financial viability of a carrier, and, and you know, can drive them towards factoring companies, which further degrades the, the profitability of a particular customer or a particular carrier. So having payment terms that are in line with industry norms really an important area to focus on in terms of, of shipper of choice. I think, again, the, the interesting thing is we're in a near-perfect market here with 360,000 carriers of varying shapes and sizes. And so, you know, the shippers that do the right things will find themselves with the capacity and, and the carriers will gravitate there, quite frankly. Those are all, you know, great examples of, uh, you know, some of the actions that, that shippers have taken. And certainly I, I've seen um, uh, a, a number of those steps being implemented, you know, by shippers, uh, you know, in response. And actually the the smart ones have been doing that for uh, for, for quite a few years. Uh, those that kind of saw this environment kind of developing over the past few years. So it's it's not something that they are kind of reactionary to right now, but uh, you know, the, the really progressive ones really have been working on this for, for quite some time. Now, kind of related to uh, shipper of choice, one, one of the things that I'm seeing more and more of is, you know, carriers beginning to implement scorecards of their of their shippers, right? So we, we always see shippers kind of, uh, as part of their performance dashboards, create scorecards of their carriers, and that's something that they use to you know, communicate and, and dr try to drive continuous improvement with their carriers. Uh, I'm kind of seeing the tables turn a little bit and, and kind of carriers doing the same thing with, with shippers and developing uh, scorecards of their shippers and, and sharing that information with, um, you know, with their shipper clients. Are, are you also seeing this trend and, and how is that changing kind of the, the shipper carrier relationships? We are seeing that trend. I think it's, I have to imagine that every carrier and every 3PL has got some manner of rating their customers, right? And we've all we've all focused on that over time to look at productivity and profitability and you know things like lead tender metrics and things like that. But today customers are asking to see that, right? They're asking for us to share that information back with them in order to you know, help them around continuous improvement. I, for for us, we've considered it a best practice. I we don't do it with every customer, but we certainly have some robust conversations with a number of our, our more integrated clients around um, us scorecarding them. It's a great opportunity for them to experience, I guess, themselves a little bit and, and see themselves through the eyes of a provider. Um, definitely a best practice for us that's driven some really, really strong conversations and helped to integrate relationships. Um, we hear from our, from our customers that it is becoming more 
more relevant or more prevalent, I should say, amongst a number of their different providers. So it's it's good to see the shipper want to hear their own voice a little bit. No, that's a that, that's a good point. I think that the challenge has always been, you, you know, you uh, you never want to be appear to be critical of a customer, right? So I think you, you know that's always the danger, right? So you may have those scorecards internally for your own internal purposes in terms of trying to understand the profitability of certain shippers or, or you know which ones are uh, you know more preferred from a standpoint of, of detention and so on and so forth. But I think historically that information has been kept kind of internally because you never want to appear to kind of be critical of a, of a customer. But, but I think what I'm seeing now is, you know, to your point, is being able to present that in a constructive way to the customers to say, hey, you know, we want to be your partner, but here's kind of our perspective of, of how, you know, our relationship impacts our business. And, and, and that can help drive some opportunities to, you know, for continuous improvement to make it a win-win, you know, situation for both the shipper and the care, and and it sounds that you know to your point, uh, it, that's manifesting itself or, or in kind of your experience with this. It it is, and and I would say too that another thing that we've seen emerge in the same vein is more and more uh, shippers kind of establishing advisory boards or advisory committees of of their key providers, almost providing a safe haven for for their key providers to come in collectively and say hey, this is what we experience across multiple companies. And if you address these things, we think you can be even more effective as, as a supplier in, in attracting and, and retaining the best capacity available in the marketplace. Excellent, excellent. Uh, you, you know, I've got a, just a couple of more questions here as we're, we're coming up on time. So I just want to remind those of you that are joining live that if you do have a question for Bob uh, or, or a comment, you know, now will be the time uh, to, to post it. So, you know, kind of as a way to kind of wrap up, uh, kind of everything we, we've talked about. I mean, what, what do shippers ultimately want and, and how do they get there, especially in, in today's market? Yep, that's, that's a good question. But I think the reality is what shippers want is they want to avoid problems, right? Shippers want to focus on their core competencies and they, depending on the complexity of their supply chain, they either want to continue to leverage that supply chain as a competitive advantage for their organization in terms of getting to market faster or more flexibly or more nimbly than their competitor, or if for less sophisticated supply chain companies, they frankly just don't want the supply chain to get in the way of sales or production, right? So I think what they want is to, to avoid issues and to, to honor their own commitments to their end customers. And the level of complexity is really depends on, on the shipper themselves. Um, you know, what we hear from our customers on, on a regular basis is that the, the role of their supply chain leadership and why they engage providers is, is they want to ultimately manage risk Right? They want to minimize or manage risk. They want to manage change, whether that's changing in the marketplace or changing in the internal dynamics of their organization. Um, they want to manage spend. Spend is always going to be an important component of supply chain. and They want to uh, either maximize their spend or minimize their expense. And, and ultimately, you know, they want to improve efficiency because today efficiency is such an important part of, of all of our supply chains. And technology helps many of many of our clients to to accomplish that that efficiency. All, all great points, and uh, you know, like I, I always say at, at the end of all my episodes, you know, we, we just managed to scratch the surface on, on a lot of these uh, on this topic. And like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this is you know the truckload industry is a, a living, breathing you know market, um, and, and I'm sure we're we're going to continue to see uh, it evolve and change over the next few months and and, and years. So certainly. Uh, you know, look forward to, you know, having you back on the program, uh, you know, down the road to kind of take another pulse and see what's what's happened, particularly after this holiday period and see how both shippers and carriers have, have fared. Um, you know, I want to change the uh, change the conversation uh, a, a little bit here and kind of wrap up on a question that I, I always like to ask, you know, my, my experienced uh, guests. And, and that is, you know, one of our goals here at Talking Logistics is to, you, you know, be able to communicate and provide advice and, and uh, insights to uh, students and young professionals. So um, what advice, you know, from your perspective and your experience, you know, what advice would you give to students and young professionals to help them pave a successful career in, in supply chain logistics? Yeah, I appreciate you asking that. And it's a passion of mine. As I, I talk to a lot of our young people as they come into the organization through our new employee training. And, you know, I think back to when I came into to the industry 15 years ago, it was really about sales and account management, sales and operations planning, and 
when I think about how the supply chains evolved just in, in the last 15 years, so many of the roles have become so much more broad than just that. And I think there will always be roles for, for sales and account management and, and strong operational executors. But boy, things like data science and business analytics, and there's so many demands for strong IT people and, and app developers. You know, that marketplace has changed so dynamically for, for what is today considered a supply chain career. So exciting opportunities there. I think my guidance or my, my direction would, would probably be a little bit more broad in, in terms of, you know, the things that I see that differentiate people is, you know, don't be afraid to come in a little early and stay a little late, right? Differentiate yourself that way. Um, you know, I think ask, ask for more responsibility with, without asking for more reward immediately, right? Realizing that the compensation is a result of an action and shouldn't be necessarily the cause of an action. And, and really work on building your personal brand whether that's inside your organization or within the industry, you really work to define your personal brand and continue to build upon that throughout your career. And, and finally, find something you love, right? Find something you love, embrace it, and, and be great at it. Don't let anything stand in the way of, of great, between you and greatness. And, and I think the supply chain industry is, is a great place to do that for sure. Yeah, great, great advice. And, and, you know, building off that last point, you know, one of the things that I, I always tell young professionals and, and students is, you know, I see a lot of interest in entrepreneurship these days. And, and, you know, what I tell folks is you can be an entrepreneur without launching your own company. You can be an entrepreneur within, you know, uh, a world class employer. Right. Um, assuming that that employer, uh, you know, embraces uh, creativity and the, the ability for people to take risks and, and to kind of uh, leverage their talents and to find new opportunities, to find new solutions to problems and so on and so forth. And, and, and I think that's where, you know, a lot of the young professionals find their passion, right? Because they, they come in with a lot of ideas and, uh, you know, it's the ability to then follow through on that and not be, not be afraid to, you know, take some risks. And obviously it takes an employer to, you know, be open to provide folks with that, uh, with that opportunity. And uh, it sounds from, from your experience there at, at CH Robinson that you've been able to, to do that over the past 15 years. So uh, certainly look forward to, um, again, thank you very much for, for taking the time to be with us today and for sharing your thoughts and advice and, and certainly look forward to having you uh, on the program again down the road. Adrian, thanks so much. We really appreciate the opportunity. Great, and thank you for, uh, for those of you that joined us today. And uh, if you're watching this program on demand, and you have a question or a comment for Bob, you can go ahead and find the episode on TalkingLogistics.com and post a question or a comment there, and I'm sure Bob will be more than happy to you know, respond via that platform. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for joining us, and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.